Today I want to turn your attention to um, a passage of Scripture that's found in the, the opening of John chapter 8. That's John's Gospel chapter 8. It is a miraculous moment in the life of an individual and I think also a miraculous moment for Jesus' followers as they um, watch Him in a very tense moment do probably what would be somewhat expected but um, at the same time unexpected by some who were there in that circle and you'll see what I'm talking about as, as we progress. Um, when you look to, to John chapter 8 you find that just before that in chapter 7 um, we are told that Jesus has been in Jerusalem for the festival of tabernacles and the festival of tabernacles had to do with that annual celebration that was centered around the miraculous provision that God made for His people when they uh, were in the wilderness after escaping Egypt and Pharaoh. And, and so they are remembering that while they were nomads in the wilderness without homes that God provided their every need. He provided shelter for them. He provided manna. He provided quail when they were tired of just manna on their diets. And just over and over again, God reaches into their, into their wandering years, if you will, and brings His rich provision to every need. As a matter of fact, it says that as they wandered about for 40 years, even their shoes did not wear out. Now you think about that. God provided everything that they needed. He does the same for us, doesn't He? He provides in, in, in uh, amazing ways for all of our given needs. And so every year they would have a festival in Jerusalem to celebrate God's wonderful provision for His people as they simply gave themselves to following His lead and His will for their lives. And so um, Jesus has been teaching uh, in the temple courtyard and He is tired uh, after a day of just being with people and interacting with people and leading them in a deeper understanding of, of the Heavenly Father and the kingdom that has to do with His eternal purpose for us. And it says that at the end of the day, He departed and went to the Mount of Olives. Now, for those who are familiar with the geography of, of, of the holy city of Jerusalem, uh, you remember that that Jerusalem is in a walled area, a protected area, and across the Kidron Valley up on the hill is the Mount of Olives, and there are breezes that blow there in that garden, and it's just a, a place where you could go and find refuge, a place where you could be quiet, a place where you could recharge your batteries, and so Jesus goes there, and He spends the night just alone, just to be with the Father, just to be with His thoughts and, and what has happened during the course of the day. And so when you pick up in John 8, it says that in verse 2, it says, At dawn He appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around Him and He sat down to teach them. And so it, it's like this. He gets up early that morning uh, at daybreak and He walks back over to the holy city He's in the temple court area, and so word starts to circulate, he's back, he's here. And the crowd gathers around him, and he proceeds to teach them again concerning God's will for their lives. And he's teaching them things that they have never heard before, and he's teaching with an authority that just absolutely captivates them. He doesn't talk in, in terms of his opinion or what he thinks might be, but with certainty, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, brings the truth of the kingdom to their hearing and to their understanding like it's never been delivered before. And then in verse 3, it says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, we are commanded that we should stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Verse 6 says, They were using this question in order to have a basis for accusing Him, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground, with his finger. Let's pause there for just a second and then we'll pick up with verse 7. So he, here's the dynamic. He's teaching again and as he's teaching, the teachers of the law 
Um, and the Pharisees, it starts to circulate among them, oh, he's back. We've got to put a stop to him. All of the crowds are gathering to him. He's causing such a stir that it's going to upset our way of, of doing business here on, around the temple of God. And we've got to do something to interrupt what's happening. And so think of this. Jesus is teaching glorious truths. And there are people who are just drinking every word that he is pouring out. But then there is this crowd who is so fixated on themselves and their eyes ideas about who God is and what God wants that they decide they've got to get Jesus out of the picture that they've got to get him uh, sidetracked or run him off the track so to speak so that they can pick up with business as usual so to do that they find a woman how in the world how in the world did they go about finding this woman who gave her up who was the other party what are the dynamics behind this drama but they bring this woman can you imagine can you imagine being taken in one of your worst moments as you live your life and being stood up at church before a religious gathering exposed for all the world to see they said here's a woman we have caught her in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says she, be, she should be stoned to death. What do you say? What an unbelievable moment for this woman. What an unbelievable moment for Jesus who is simply pouring out the truths of God's love and His eternal plan for His creation. And then these people come and completely disrupt the glory of what's happening in that moment. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him. In other words, Jesus, what are you going to do with this? You can't ignore it. It's not going to go away. What are you going to do? When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this point, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And so it sounds like even the disciples departed that, that place where Jesus was standing side by side with this woman who was condemned. Jesus asked her, Woman, where are they? The ones who condemned you. She said, Lord, they're not here. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. There was a time when every one of us we're in spiritual darkness. Amen? Amen? There was a time when um, we could have been taken in, in one of our worst moments before we came into the light of Christ and His love for us and we could have been stood up before a group of people and we would have been worthy of condemnation. And I'll tell you this, if we don't see that about ourselves, then maybe true repentance has not taken place. Amen. Because repentance only happens. A change of mind about ourselves, a change of mind about our God. The word repentance means change of mind. That change takes place in the light of the truth of who we really are and who God is. Who He really is. And so there was a time in my life when there is no way in the world that I would have want, wanted to be put in the middle of a church group and have my life exposed. All of us, at some point in our human existence, have found ourselves in dark places spiritually. And there were plenty of people looking on, observing our lives, who could have stood up in front of the church and called for a reckoning in our lives. And they would have been justified. 
If they were going by the law of Moses, they would have had every right to stand me up at one point in my young teenage life and pronounce judgment on me. There's no question. As a matter of fact, it is the pronouncement of judgment against sin that has made the cross necessary. If there were no sin, Jesus did not need to die on the cross. But it is because of the reality of our sinfulness that Jesus laid down His life on that Friday on the cross that His blood might be shed for us. There was a time when we could have been brought in the middle of the crowd, the religious crowd, just like this woman was brought that day. She was guilty. We were guilty. She was lost. We have been lost. She was living for the moment. For the most part, a selfish existence. And we're no strangers to that. We've lived for personal gain and personal pleasure and personal satisfaction. We, we have a story just like she had a story. She was worthy of the judgment that was being exercised against her that was being called for in that moment. Do you notice Jesus never asked her, did you really commit adultery? That was not in question. She, she had done what was wrong in terms of what the law of Moses had delivered to the people. There was no question about her guilt. There was no, well, I, I, I'm sure... I'm sure if you had to do over, you would do it differently. There was, there was none of that kind of discussion. There was just a simple, a simple question that was directed to her as the crowd departed after they were challenged. If you're without sin, you throw the first rock of judgment against her. And they knew. As a matter of fact, some commentators say the second time that Jesus knelt down and was writing in the sand, there are some who speculate that He was writing the names and the sins of those who were holding the rocks waiting to kill her for her sin. We'll know when we get to heaven what He wrote in the sand, I think. But that speculation may not be far off as far as the, the scholars speculate. Maybe it was their names and their sins that were being cataloged that day. Whatever was happening, one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped, they dropped the rocks that they were holding and they walked away. And the only thing Jesus said to the woman, he, it was, there was no sermon about, you shouldn't have done that, you know better than that. There was none of that. Women, woman, where are those who condemned you. There are none, Lord, they're gone. Neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 of John 3, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn them, but that the world might be saved. As many as believe are saved. As many as don't believe are lost, are condemned. In that moment when Jesus asked her, where are your accusers? In that moment when she confessed they're not here. In that moment when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. There was a faith transaction that took place in that moment. In that moment, she came to believe more in the words of Jesus than the words of the accusers. The word of the accusers was she didn't deserve to live another day. She was such a miserable failure by the way she had lived her life. The only thing she deserved was death. That was the word of the accusers. The word of Jesus was, I'm going to give you a brand new life. 
I'm going to give you a brand new opportunity to find out why God put you on this planet. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to save you. Now go and find a new life. And leave the shadows of sin behind you. Jesus loved her. Jesus loves us. That single fact changes everything for any given person in a moment. In a moment. I was 16 years old when I got saved. Oh, I'm so glad I got saved at 16. Because at 16, I already had so many things I wished I had done differently. That's unbelievable, but it's the truth. I am so glad that when I was brought into the church, that I had the opportunity to come into a church that believed in the redemption of people. That it was a church where people were welcome to come within its walls regardless of what their story was. I had no religious background to speak of except for my Nana and a couple other godly folks in, in my world. I didn't have any church attendance record to boast of. I, I didn't know any Bible stories. I, I, I didn't grow up learning about all these different stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was all new to me. But I was blessed to be brought into a church that treated me like somebody before I felt like somebody. A church that believed that no matter who you were or what your story was, that there was an opportunity for a brand new story to unfold because Jesus loves you. And that woman experienced that redemption that day, and I experienced redemption because of this same merciful truth that comes to us through these lines that are found in John chapter 8. We weren't looking to be saved. Maybe looking to be spared, but not saved. But He saved us. We weren't looking for a religious experience or a connection with those who hung out um, for her in the temple area, for us in the church area. We weren't looking for that in particular, but we received Something that opened our eyes to who God is and what He's up to that goes beyond religion, that goes beyond tradition. His words to that woman that day have rung true in our lives. Neither do I condemn you. I'm going to give you a brand new life. I didn't get what I deserved, and I received what I could never provide for myself. How about you? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. There are some modern day followers of Jesus who would go in and change the wording of that, of that first verse of Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote it just like that. He saw himself... Before the grace of God was applied in his behalf, he saw himself as wretched because of what sin had done to him. He was involved in the slave trade of his day. He captained a ship that would bring slaves from Africa to North America. And it was on one of those voyages that God reached in and touched his heart and, and he left that trade behind and and sought a new life because of the mercy that God was bringing to him. The modern writers would have us to, to sing it something like this, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved one such as I, 
Oh, you dare not call someone wretched. <laughs> right? We've got to cancel all of that, right? You've got to count, cancel all this stuff that might offend someone. But the truth is, before Jesus came into my life, I was a wretch. I lived for myself, even as a teenager, lived for myself, going my own direction, deciding what was best for me. Never giving a thought to the Bible or what God would have for me. That's a wretched life, right? Amazing grace came to us in our darkest moment and helped us to realize that God loves us not because of our performance, but He loves us because He has created us for Himself. Some folks say, when I get my life straight, I'm going to church. And I'll be honest with you, the church is by and large responsible for people thinking that way. I think sometimes we've forgotten that this is the place where people are, be, are supposed to be able to come into the company of those who know Him that they might come to know Him. That people might understand we're, that we're here to worship Him for what He has done in our lives, not to celebrate each other for what we've been doing for God. Amazing grace in our darkest moment was brought to our understanding. Do we need grace? Oh, you bet we do. Because there's not a one of us who could even begin to change our own story. Only He can do that. But He can do that. I'm interested when I get to heaven to find out what happened with this woman after that day. Because nothing else is written about her in Scripture. No, nothing tells us what happened as she left the presence of Jesus. No, nothing is written about she did leave her life of sin she, she did become a brand new story written uh, because of the blood of Jesus that would be shed in her behalf. But, but one of the things that's going to happen when we get over yonder is we're going to be able to see people like her and get what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. I'm looking forward to that. I think I'll be able to spend a lot of eternity living in the, the glory of what God has done one person at a time as He called them into His light, into His love, into His grace. I, I love hearing stories about people who have come to know God and have dedicated their lives to living for Him. I, I love to hear the back story. I, I love to hear about what it was like before they opened their hearts and what, what happened after they opened their hearts. I'm anxious to find out how she spent the rest of her journey on this earth because of that fateful day. I trust she received the grace that was offered that day. I know I'm glad I received the grace. I know I'm glad that I made a personal decision for Jesus. And it was, a, it was a moment of faith because I didn't know enough to even talk about salvation. I was no theologian. I, I, it was the summer before my junior year in high school. I was a high school kid. But I knew that Jesus had made himself known to me. And it was a moment of faith. Religion and the religious crowd sought to destroy that woman that day because of her sin. To remove her, they would say to remove the cancer from their holy company. Lord, forgive us for thinking that it is our job to cleanse the company 
of God's people. But Jesus sought to redeem her, to make her a member of the family of God. That's a truth to be embraced. But it's also a truth to represent to others who need the Savior. I pray we'll always be a loving church. I pray that we will always be a people who believes in the hope that belongs to those who are in darkness because of what Jesus can do in their lives and in their experience. I pray that, that God would allow us to remain humble even after we've served Him for decades. That we would know after years of knowing Him and giving ourselves to His service that it's still because of His love that we're saved. Not because of our service. Not because of our prowess. Not because of our holiness. Anything we are is because of the goodness of God. Anything we have is because of the goodness of God. It's all right there. There is no one today, however dark their existence, who is very far from being redeemed because Jesus is among us. No one, however dark their existence, is not very far from being redeemed because Jesus is among us. Tony's been teaching on the book of Romans on Wednesday night. And Wednesday night we looked at Romans 10. And in Romans 10, there's this passage about midway through where the Apostle Paul says to the believers at Rome, salvation doesn't happen as a result of us calling Jesus down from heaven, and it doesn't happen as a result of us bringing Him up from the dead. He says, the word of salvation is in your mouth. For if you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. And do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying what I, what I just said before. Jesus is among us. And the reason we can confess Him and put our faith in Him is because He's present. And just he, as He was right there beside of that woman that day saying, I don't condemn you. I want to give you a brand new life. He's here today saying the same thing to us and He would say the same thing through us as we go out into our worlds this week. Listen, there are people who are not going to church anywhere and they'll never hear us preachers talking about what I'm talking about today. Their only hope is for you to bring up Jesus in the conversation. That's their only hope. If I were on a cruise ship and that cruise ship met with disaster and I were tossed overboard, it's very unlikely that the captain would be the one to throw me the life preserver. The likelihood is it would be another one who is near to peril themselves and yet still has footing enough to throw me a life jacket or throw me a life preserver that would be my hope for being saved. God wants you to throw the lifeline to some folks this week. Y'all, yeah. we got to talk about Jesus. Where we live, where we work, where we go to school. Because if you'll check the statistics, there's a very small percentage of people 
in the United States and in the world who are coming to places of worship like this. Someone's got to tell them, and you are that someone. Are you saved? Is there someone in your world who needs to be saved? Will you tell them about Jesus? You don't have to save them. You don't have to figure out how to get them from where they are to where they need to be. All you've got to do is bring them into the light of who Jesus is. And if you're saved, you know today, Jesus knows how to talk to someone's heart. Amen? Amen. Jesus knows how to look someone in the eye and give them a brand new, brand new lease on life. Today, I thank the Lord for saving a wretch like me. I thank the Lord for allowing me to see the light when I was living in the darkness, not looking for Him. I thank the Lord that heaven is my, is my eternal home, not because I've earned it, but because He's given that opportunity to me and to you. Woman, where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. I'm not going to condemn you either. I'm going to give you a brand new life. Lord, this morning, there are people all around us who need a brand new life. And sometimes we, thought, we have thought that we need to go back and clean up the messes we've made. And Lord, that's, that's not even possible. The best thing we can do at any given time in our, in our journey is to bring ourselves and our broken pieces and lay them all before you and receive the redemption and the salvation and the newness that you're wanting to bring to our lives. Lord, the devil wants to use our past against us, but we all have a past. But because of Jesus, we all have a future. And so, Lord, help us to let go of what has damned us, what would condemn us, and help us to take hold of what can save us. Because the debate is not, do we need to be saved? The debate is, will we be saved? Will we receive the mercy that You're extending to us through Your Son, Jesus? And Lord, will we become party to helping others to see the truth about Jesus' love and redemption for their lives? So save us, Lord, and help us to help others to find their salvation by making you the center of our existence. Lord, I look forward to hearing that woman's story when I get home about what happened after that day. But I thank you for this story and I thank you what, for what happened in that day because, Lord, it helps us to know your heart toward us and your purpose for us. Save us by your amazing grace. Save us, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen.